Good morning, everyone. And before I make my announcement regarding our pressure campaign against the Islamic Republic of Iran, I, I want to address yesterday's terrorist attack in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, what was supposed to be a joyful Easter Sunday was marred by a horrific wave of Islamic radical terror uh, bloodshed. It's heartbreaking that a country which has strived so hard for peace in recent years uh, has been targeted by these terrorists. Uh, we mourn the loved ones of the victims, some of whom we can confirm were indeed U.S. citizens. This is America's fight, too. I spoke with the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka this morning, and our embassy and other parts of this government are offering all possible assistance to Americans and the Sri Lankan government alike. We urge that any evildoers uh, be brought to justice expeditiously, and America is prepared to support that. Uh, we also stand with the millions of Sri Lankans who support the freedom of their fellow citizens to worship as they please. We take confidence in knowing that not even atrocities like this one will deter them from respecting religious freedom. Today our nation grieves with the people of Sri Lanka, and we stand uh, committed, resolved to confront terrorism together. Now turning to uh, Iran. <coughs> Uh, almost one year ago, after withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal, President Trump implemented the strongest pressure campaign in history against the Islamic Republic of Iran. The goal remains simple, to deprive the outlaw regime of the funds it has used to destabilize the Middle East for four decades and incentivize Iran to behave like a normal country. Up to 40 percent of the regime's revenue comes from oil sales. It's the regime's number one source of cash. Before our sanctions went into effect, Iran would generate as much as $50 billion annually in oil revenue. Overall, to date, we estimate that our sanctions have denied the regime well north of $10 million. The regime would have used that money to support terror groups like Hamas and Hezbollah and continue its uh, missile development in defiance of UN Security Council Resolution 2231. And it would have perpetuated the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Our goal has been to get countries to cease importing Iranian oil entirely. Last November, we granted exemptions from our sanctions to seven countries and to Taiwan. With this is to give our allies and partners to wean themselves off of Iranian oil and to assure a well-supplied oil market. Today, I am announcing that we will no longer grant any exemptions. We're going to zero, going to zero across the board. We will continue to enforce sanctions and monitor compliance. Any nation or entity interacting with Iran should do its diligence and err on the side of caution. The risks are simply not going to be worth the benefits. I, I want to emphasize that we have used the highest possible care in our decision to ensure market stability. The United States has been in constant discussion with allies and partners to help them transition away from Iranian crude to other alternatives. And we have been working with uh, major oil producing countries to ensure the market has sufficient volume to minimize uh, the impact on pricing. Both the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have assured us they will ensure an appropriate supply for the markets. And of course, the United States is now a significant producer as well. I can confirm that uh, uh, each of those suppliers are working directly with Iran's former customers to make the transition away from Iranian crude less disruptive. And uh, as I said, we're doing our part here in the United States, too, in 2018. Uh, crude production increased by 1.6 million barrels per day over the 2017 levels, and the U.S. Energy Information Agency predicts an increase of an additional 1.5 million barrels per day in calendar year 2019. Look, with the announcement today, we've made clear our seriousness uh, of purpose. We are going to zero. We, how long we remain there at zero depends solely on the Islamic Republic of Iran's senior leaders. We've made our demands very clear to the Ayatollah and his cronies. End your pursuit of nuclear weapons. Stop testing and proliferating ballistic missiles. Stop sponsoring and committing terrorism. Halt the arbitrary detention of U.S. citizens. Our pressure is aimed at fulfilling these demands and others, and it will continue to accelerate until Iran is willing to address them at the negotiating table. Finally, as I've said before, these demands are not just coming from the United States government and many of our allies and partners, they are similar to what we hear from the Iranian people themselves. I want the Iranian people to know that we are listening to them and standing with them. We will not appease their oppressors, 
as the last administration did. Our hopes are for a better life for them and all people afflicted by the regime's violence and destruction. I will now take a few questions. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Secretary. Good morning, sir. Thank you. Um, I just uh, broadly on Iran, uh, aside from this, it, your goal, you just said bring them back to the negotiating table, but it, are you really interested in renegotiating the JCPOA or negotiating something like that? Or are you just looking for, are the, all these steps that you're taking look, uh, aimed at just getting them to change their behavior without getting anything in return? And then secondly, if you could just address a report about comments you allegedly made to Iranian um, diaspora leaders last week in, in, in Texas. What, what are Is, the comments what, in particular? That, that, that um, the, you're not interested in any kind of military intervention, that it's basically ep economic diplomatic pressure, and that uh, and some, uh, I don't know, some, some kind of comment about the MEK, and you're, you're not. Yeah, let me, uh, Matt, thank you. Let me try and take those. I'll take them in reverse, in reverse sequence. We've not supported any outside group. <laughs> Uh, for, we've, we're supporting the Iranian people, uh, and so uh, I get questions all the time about uh, outside Iranian groups, including the MEK. Uh, and I want I, every time I engage with anyone, and this was a meeting with uh, folks who have family, of, often had family inside of Iran. I want to make clear to them we're supporting the Iranian people, and not any particular group. Uh, that's the uh, U.S. administration's policy. Second, uh, with respect to our objectives. Uh, we're happy to receive the uh, – we're, we're happy to get the outcome however we can achieve it. Uh, the President has always made very clear – we've made clear to the Iran's leaders that if Americans are attacked, we will respond in a serious way. Uh, and so I don't think there should be any doubt about the fact that if uh, it is required for us to take an action in response to something that uh, Qasem Soleimani does or the Iranian leadership or a Shia militia somewhere in the world, that we will respond to that in a way uh, that is appropriate to protect American interests wherever we find them. Uh, with respect to our goal, we, we laid them out. We laid them out. There are 12 things we're looking for. Uh, when we get to those things, we are happy to re-engage with Iran as a normal nation. If they're prepared to come to the table and negotiate of those things to get to that outcome, fantastic. If not, the campaign with which we've been engaged uh, since, frankly, the administration took office, but more clearly since the President's decision to withdraw from the JCPOA, uh, the campaign will continue. And we built that enormous coalition to work on this, right? Gulf State Partners, uh, Israel, lots of countries that are working alongside us to achieve these objectives. You see the Europeans with increasing risk from the assassination campaign that's taking place inside of their country. We watch as Iran continues to try and have um, a role in protecting Maduro in Venezuela. This is, this is causing countries in South America to understand that the expeditionary nature of the Islamic Republic is something that threatens uh, citizens all across the world. And so uh, this is not the United States alone. It's a, a true coalition uh, working to achieve the ends which we've laid out. Thank you. Matt. Thank you, ma'am. Um, good morning, Mr. Secretary. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. <clears throat> With the maximum pressure campaign, um, have you detected any change in the Iranian behavior? With the few exceptions that you mentioned, I think, before, which is uh, short of cash of to Hezbollah and maybe to not giving all to the Syrian regime. And also talking about senior leadership, do you have any comment about the appointment of the new leader of the uh, IRGC? Uh, I think his name is Mr. Yeah. Hussein Salami. Yes. Uh, because he's been praised as a hard, hardliner anti US. Uh, so. We, we have watched Iran have diminished power as a result of our campaign. Their capacity to wreak harm around the world is absolutely clearly diminished. I talked about it with respect to Hezbollah not being able to make payroll in a timely fashion. I've talked about it in other, in other places as well. Uh, what we're announcing this morning, the designation of the IRGC a couple of weeks back, actions that we'll take in a handful of weeks, each of these things will continue. Uh, to support the Iranian people so that they can get what they ultimately uh, are so desperately seeking. Uh, I don't have any comment on the new appointment of the IRGC, other than, uh, IRGC leader. Other than this, uh, you, you described him as a hardliner. It, it, is, it, it is the case that every Iranian leader, that includes President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif, has accepted the notion, has accepted this fundamental notion of the nature of the regime itself. Right, so th they accept that the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, is the appropriate method for which Iran to engage. When, when, once they've conceded that, in our view, 
th these distinctions are often are, are often insignificant. That is, if you are pushing and you're supporting Qasem Soleimani's efforts in Iraq, if you're supporting the efforts of the RZ Quds Force in Hezbollah, and you're supporting the underwriting of Hamas, by definition, that is working against what America has laid out as our objective. Thank you, sir. Take one more morning. Yeah. morning. Hello, how are you, Mr. Secretary? I'm very good, thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, I want to ask you about the timing of your announcement. Um, oil supplies are pretty tight, given that a lot of oils come off, uh, Venez uh, from, off Venezuela as well. Um, what are your discussions? Um, China said today that, you, that the U.S. had reached beyond its jurisdiction. What, if your, what assurances do you have from Saudi Arabia, the UAE, to, to um, uh, supply the market in a timely fashion? Mm -hmm. um, and second, do you believe that, uh, I think it's the five largest importers of, of Iranian oil, um, will abide by what, what you're asking of them? With respect to your second question, um, it, we've made clear, it, if you don't abide by this, there'll be sanctions. Right? This, is, this is what we're laying out this morning. We, we have a uh, requirement uh, and to conduct these transactions one almost always needs to participate in the financial markets and we intend to enforce the sanctions we don't lay out sanctions that we don't have any intention of uh, encouraging countries to cooperate with with respect I'll, I'll leave to, uh, others to talk about the details of what the Saudis and the Emiratis have agreed to but I've had conversations the president has had conversations uh, with these countries and they, they have committed to making sure that there is a sufficient supply in the markets uh, and, and I'm confident that we'll achieve that. I'm confident that they'll support uh, the, this policy that is consistent with their objectives as well. One more? Take one more? Yes, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Thank you, you sir. Very quickly, What's that? you could stay all day. Uh, <laughs> Very quickly, sir. Got to get to the Easter egg roll. <laughs> so you said that you, you, you are at zero uh, level today. Is that, is that effective today? Or did it's, they May, have it's May 2nd. They, the current, May, May the current waivers expire uh, uh, in, okay. in, on, on May, so, midnight May 1st, I think So they're is. not getting like any grace period beyond May 2nd. There are no, there All are, must stop. There are, no, there are no SRE waivers that extend beyond uh, that period, and, full, full stop. So in, in the interim, they need to look at other sources like That's to right. make up for what Look, we've, 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 we've always tried, and I, I think we've always been very fair about this. If there's a particular transaction that is incidental act, right? So I don't want to foreclose the possibility, but there will be no waivers that extend beyond uh, the 1st of May. Yeah, Great. Th thank you all. Thank you all very much. Sir. Yes, sure. Uh, do you think the incident there says anything about the dangers ISIS continues to pose now that uh, the, they've been defeated on the battleground? Yes, radical Islamist terror remains a threat. The president's been very clear about that. I think I've been very clear about that. Uh, we are continuing to do uh, real work against uh, these uh, these evil human beings that went into places of worship on Easter Sunday, uh, yeah, the, we, we've, we've taken that threat down substantially. The destruction of the caliphate was important and it mattered, and the, and the takedown of these threats from other geographies as well. Um, but sadly, this evil exists in the world, and uh, the United States and all of its partners that are cooperating in the de-ISIS campaign, some 80 countries, uh, and uh, other nations too that are, that are assisting us uh, in defeating this terrorism around the world, uh, we have to remain active and vigilant, and uh, it's going to require uh, attention. There's, there's no doubt about that. Well, so yeah, thank you all very much. Quick. Thank you. Have a, have a great thank day. You. Thank, thank you. you. Nick from. The end. But just specifically, is there a wind down period? What kind of wind down period will, will there be? Uh, and as, as you know, um, with China and Turkey, you're in the middle of, of huge strategic conversations with, with them. Turkey, obviously, F, S 400, F 35, China, the, in, the entire trade talks. Do you, have, do you believe that this uh, announcement, this move, will impact those larger strategic talks? Thanks. Can I do the first one? Oh, sure. Let's speak to the wind down period. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, I would say that we've, the wind down period, if we look at it, was, will be a year in terms of going to zero. We've been very clear from the outset um, when the, the administration initiated its withdrawal from the JCPOA. Uh, so that continues. 
Uh, we've already taken a million and a half barrels off the market uh, and are finalizing our path to zero, which will end uh, on uh, 2nd May. Um, we're, we're doing this purposefully. The Secretary made the announcement today to provide uh, the ability for markets to uh, may be managed uh, prior to the expiration. And we're doing this in close cooperation and consultation uh, with some of the largest producers in the world uh, alongside of the U.S. production. Uh, so we very, feel very confident in terms of uh, the global uh, oil markets will be, remain well supplied. Sorry, one year from May 2nd, you're saying, or one year from the we, JCPOA? We, we, we started this last right. May, right? right? We'll be, have hit that one year this May. Right. So uh, what we say the wind down period was be, began then. We've been very clear in terms of our path to zero, uh, and we're uh, pleased to see that uh, global market conditions and cooperation from other partners uh, allow us to, uh, to, to close out uh, this year to zero. No further wind down period after May 2nd. There will be no additional SREs granted. That is, that is the policy. With respect to the impact, the point of this is not to um, uh, negatively impact other countries. We, have, we are doing everything we can to ensure a well-supplied oil market and that there aren't any supply interruptions. We have a very well-supplied oil market right now. We have always said from the time, this has been a year now, we've said this repeatedly, Frank and I have and the Secretary, the President, we are not looking to grant any exceptions or waivers to our campaign of maximum economic pressure. And this is the only way, this is the biggest leverage we have on the Islamic Republic of Iran is their oil exports. And if you want to seek a change in behavior, you have to show seriousness of purpose on the oil. And we're seeing, I was here a week or two ago giving a briefing on the impact that we are seeing. With this decision today, we expect to see more positive impacts to deny Iran the revenue it needs to conduct its foreign policy, to fund its proxies and satellites around the region, to fund its missile program. And that's a very positive thing. And so we think that this sort of move uh, pays a lot of benefits for the Middle East broadly to promote peace and stability. It is, it, is, it is very hard to imagine a peaceful and stable Middle East if you accept the status quo of Iran's expansionist foreign policy. Can you talk try, about try, the, try, the, try. Michelle? the sanctions that these countries could face? I mean, are you talking about targeted sanctions? Or are you talking about sanctions that could affect the U.S. trade relationship with countries like India and China. I don't have anything to add beyond what the Secretary said. We will sanction any sanctionable behavior. We have given countries, uh, after the President announced he was leaving the deal, countries were given a six-month pre-wind down before the sanctions were reimposed in November. And then because we had a very tight and fragile oil market in November, the President decided to grant a, a handful of waivers. Uh, we've always wanted to get to zero as quickly as market conditions will permit. We just face a much better oil picture globally than we did six months ago, and it will only improve from here. And so yeah. that's why we're in a better place. I, I just want to I, I understand you, the Secretary, uh, and the White House also have all said there will be no more SREs uh, granted, uh, the waivers granted. But does that mean we'll all of these countries whose waivers are expiring on the 2nd get hit with sanctions on May 3 if they haven't cut all of their um, purchases? Or is there some kind of leeway in there for them to, let's say, continue to take delivery of pre of, of, of oil that they purchased before May 2nd, before the waivers expire? Or will they be able to use money after May, May 2nd um, that, that's already been set aside for, for, for these purchases? I mean, I, forget about whether the waivers will be continued. Are they going to get hit with sanctions starting May 3? I think the Secretary spoke to that. Yeah, he already spoke to it. We don't have anything to add beyond what he well, said. I, well, he didn't, actually, because no, he I, you keep saying that SREs won't be – look, because be, I, 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 I'm not accusing you. <laughs> I just don't want this to be like you're playing cute here. Will India, Turkey, Japan, South Korea, or the, or the, China get hit with sanctions on May 3rd if they do not stop between now and then 
taking delivery of Iranian oil. It's a hypothetical that the Secretary has already addressed. Hi, um, can you talk a little bit about the numbers? You said that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 1.5 million barrels have been taken off the market. So how many was Iran exporting <clears throat> last year at this time? How many are they exporting now? And the five countries that are still largely importing Iranian oil, um, how much are they importing? Well, we can get, uh, with respect to the, some of the specific numbers in the 1.5, that's been, uh, we've made that, uh, those numbers uh, available publicly in the past. In terms of the specific countries, that's subject, some of those are subject to uh, ongoing, you know, the diplomatic discussions we have. There's plenty of published uh, reporting on, in terms of estimates on what different countries are importing. Uh, and we just uh, we have any further anything further comment on those specifically. Um, I think what the other point the secretary underscored was just the tremendous increase and in continued uptick in production in the United States, and how EIA continues uh, to have to re revise upward uh, almost on a couple month basis in terms of what U.S. production uh, what the U.S. production is. And just uh, last year, adding 1.6 million barrels. Uh, to the market is, is significant. We're on trend to uh, project to do something along similar this year. Um, so we're very confident in terms of the overall supply. I think the other point is global oil stocks are, are at five-year averages. Um, that's important. Uh, and we're in a very uh, positive uh, position relative to some of the other producers that the Secretary alluded to that are uh, working with us in partnership. Those prices went up significantly today, though. Can you speak to that? Do you expect them to level out later this week? We saw we saw some some increase. It's hard to conflate our announcements uh, that was made versus other things. I think just a few hours prior, you could look at other reporting uh, as to the, the OPEC curtailment. Um, there's lots of reasons in terms of uh, what affects oil markets. Um, what we're here to say also, though, and as the secretary alluded. Uh, you're, we're having do it, we're doing this in coordination with other major producers, and we l would refer you to uh, to their uh, their actions as well. Uh, we're doing this to ensure, in a coordinated way, to ensure that uh, the the global oil market uh, is well supplied. Great, thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you.